This episode of Things You Missed is brought to you by the CZ's World Merch Store. Stick around to the end of this video to hear about our free merch giveaway. The biggest theme that I picked up on in The Shape of Water was actually not water, but rather time. Right off from the opening scene, we are bombarded with symbols related to time. Eliza's life is constantly on a tight schedule. She keeps an alarm clock and a watch on the table next to her bed, just two of many clocks seen around her apartment. She's always on top of keeping track of the date using her calendar. The calendar also features quotes on the back of each page, one of which compares the flow of a river to the flow of time. But despite all of this, she is constantly late. Whenever she shows up to work, her coworker Zelda always has to rush her and pull her to the front of the timestamp line so she can clock in on time. The timestamps, by the way, are another time reference because being on time seems to be a huge deal at the company that they work at. There's a huge clock on the outside of the building, and director Guillermo del Toro really wants his audience to notice the time motif. But the question is, what does it mean? One of the timers that Eliza has in her apartment is a kitchen timer, which is shaped like an egg. Eggs may have a greater significance than just being the food that Eliza feeds Amphibian Man. They don't really give him a name in this movie, so I guess I'll just call him... Gabe. Gabeian. But if you look at it in a broader, more symbolic sense in terms of their relationship, Eliza offers her eggs to Gabe, which could be seen as a symbol of reproductive fertility, especially given the weird stuff that goes down later in the movie. Which takes us back to Eliza's egg timer, because human fertility is on a rather strict timer as well, which Eliza, who looks to be in her 40s, is coming up on. And like Dimitri's timer, the one he attaches to the building circuit panel, once time is up, it's lights out. Although that could just be a reference to death. We do see the first kill take place in that scene as a result. There's also a scene where Eliza is waiting for the bus and sits next to a man holding a birthday cake, a symbol for aging. Then Giles, during the part where he's feeling rejected and unwanted, says he feels he was born too early or too late, which is most likely a response to him being kicked out of his favorite pie place because of his sexual orientation. He wishes he lived in an era where he could be accepted for who he is. That also plays a part in the reason he helps Eliza, because he can relate to her in the sense that most of the world doesn't understand him. That's not to say Giles didn't need some convincing and a slap in the face to get him going though. Did anyone notice Eliza checking her watch right before hitting him? This could be her trying to break out of her shell. She is usually quiet, reserved, and as I mentioned, always late. But in order to save Gabe, she knows she has to change to challenge authority and be spot on time in order for the heist to work. We know this because they have to synchronize their watches and there's a four minute window to success. Eliza still does end up being late during the heist, but she gets lucky when Dimitri ends up being on their side. When Eliza develops her next plan to release Gabe on October 10th, she's once again faced with the time challenge. Dimitri tells her she needs to release him by then as a health concern. Drickland is given until then to bring back the asset with his life on the line, so he bears after the fish napper, leaving Eliza no time to spare anyway. It is only then that she finally makes it to the docks on time and gets herself and Gabe to safety, presumably also beating the biological clock as she takes a dive with Gabe. This movie's so weird. The use of color also seems to tie into the time theme that Del Toro has woven into the story. This is explained when Giles presents his artwork to the Jello company, and they tell him that they don't want red Jello anymore because green is the color of the future, which led me to assume that red represented the past. We also see some yellows in this movie, so maybe they represent the present. You can let me know your own ideas in the comments. I think one of the reasons I can get behind the idea is because we see Strickland's transition to becoming what the Cadillac dealer refers to as a man of the future. When we first see Strickland's family, they're all wearing yellow, and everything in the house is yellow but he really wants to get ahead of the curve in order to impress the company that he works for, where literally everything is green or teal. They're interchangeable here. He buys the teal car, and as he's driving home, he passes a group of people in another Cadillac. They are all wearing yellow. This is the visual metaphor of him pulling out of the past into the future. We know he's always craving green, since we see him carry around those green candies he enjoys so much. We know he's unsatisfied with his yellow wife, and he goes after Eliza, a green who is much more innovative and forward thinking. After he gets the car, we start to see his family transition to green, at least in their wardrobe, but his wife stays the same. 
Eliza, on the other hand, may be painted as one of the most future-oriented characters, because she is always seen in green and wears a large emerald throughout the movie. The only time we see her regress to red is when she loses confidence and she's seen crying in the locker room. I also noticed that in Strickland's office, there are three phones, red, black, and green. I'd have to see the movie again to remember who called on which phone, but I'm willing to bet it plays into the color trends that I've been pointing to. Giles is also another example I can use. He's going after the job to draw that jello advertisement as I mentioned, and while doing so, he has cravings for key lime pie, which is teal. After getting rejected, he's feeling down and reverts to ordering a red pie. It looked like maybe cherry. But when it comes to the heist, he knows he has to step up his game, and as he mentioned, be brave like Eliza. So he wears green for that. I could probably go on and on because every shot in the movie is coded with these colors, so let me know what you noticed in the comments. It's mentioned that green and teal are perceived very similarly. I would maybe call some of those shades, like the soap in the bathroom for example, more of an aquamarine because believe me, I know that color. I know that color. I know that color. I think aquamarine is an appropriate color choice for such an aqua-heavy movie. Outside of the obvious flood bursting out the bathroom door stuff, there were some interesting and poetic uses of water in the movie, such as Strickland intentionally spilling his glass of water to get Eliza to come clean it up. In doing so, he takes advantage of Eliza's love for the aquatic to try to seduce her. And as we know, it doesn't work, and Strickland is made an example of by another one of Eliza's calendar quotes. Life is but the shipwreck of our plans. He is much like the Greek mythological figure Tantalus, who Giles references earlier in the movie. He was made to stand in a pool of water beneath the fruit tree with low branches, with the fruit ever eluding his grasp, and the water always receding before he could take a drink. When Dimitri first meets the Russian spies at that one restaurant, they order surf and turf. This continues the trend of characters ordering the very thing that they're going after. The Russians want control over an amphibious creature, meaning it can get around underwater or on land, surf or turf. The water may also foreshadow the connection shared by Eliza and Gabe. We see early on that she loves the idea of being underwater. This could have something to do with the fact that she's mute and you can only communicate in sign under the surface, but she dreams of living underwater before she ever meets Gabe. And early on, she's seen masturbating in the tub, which is the same place that she ends up hiding Gabe, so that could allude to their sexual relationship. And then the bathroom is the first place that they... Well, you get the picture. And finally, we have the last quote of the film, delivered by Giles. Unable to perceive the shape of you, I find you all around me. He's talking about water, which, as I mentioned in my last video, has no set molecular structure, no shape. But when submerged, the subject is completely surrounded by it. The story of the silent princess comes full circle, beginning and ending with her fully submerged in water. In both the opening and ending scenes, we see the next major motif, shoes. One of Eliza's shoes can be seen floating in the closet in the opening dream sequence, and when she joins Gabe in the ocean at the end of the journey, the shoe is seen slipping off of her foot. It's almost as if she's been dreaming about a fish person coming into her life and sweeping her off her feet all along, but that's really weird to think about. In the last video, we talked about the idea of shoes representing her life on land and her not needing them in the ocean. So the shoe slipping off her foot could represent her giving up her life on the land. I'm going to take that theory one step further, pun intended, and say that Eliza's shoes represent her way of artistic expression and communication, and while living underwater, no longer needs them. Early on, we see her cleaning the shoes to give them that crisp tap sound. So when she's prancing down the hall or tap dancing with Giles in front of the TV, she expresses herself rhythmically or musically. She's obviously interested in music and singing, as evidenced by her whistling and the part where she actually speaks and imagines herself singing on stage with Gabe. We also see her literally using that tapping sound to communicate, like when she taps the wall to get Giles' attention, or when Zelda asks her to tap the phone so she knows that Eliza is listening. Whoa, hold up a sec. Time out. How weird is it that I've been using this Legend of Zelda clip to demonstrate the extended lifespan of amphibious fish people, and then it turns out there's a character in this movie named Zelda, and then on top of that, there's a character who's referred to as a princess, and then on top of that, we have a silent protagonist who wears green. I just thought I'd point that out. Uh, if you know what I'm talking about, leave a like on this video. But anyways, back on topic here. Zelda complains that her feet are killing her while they're working. 
So if the shoes are the thing that grounds you to the land on the surface, and Eliza is ditching them to be with her soulmate underwater, then Zelda's shoes must represent her marriage to her husband, which we later find out is not a good situation. Maybe I'm looking too far into that, I don't know, I'm sure I'll hear it from you guys if I am. Much of the movie has Gabe locked up, with Eliza and Zelda trying to get him to freedom. Both characters have symbols of flying free on them. Zelda has this bird pin that she wears during the breakout scene, and there are also some similar birds on the wall in her home. Eliza has a butterfly jewel on her collar. They have this wardrobe display set up at my theater, so here's a better look. Take this with a grain of salt, but Strickland tells Eliza he thinks he can make her squawk, which is possibly another bird reference. In any event, we can infer that Strickland has no game whatsoever. Gabe, on the other hand, <laughs> you know what, this will probably never seem normal to me, no matter how many times I see this movie. One other thing that stood out to me was what appeared to be an Egyptian hieroglyphics design on Giles' couch. The ancient Egyptians are known for building the Sphinx and actually worshipping cats as gods. You'll notice that Giles has over a million cats running around. He has so many that it's not even a big deal when Gabe bites one of their heads off. The cat, by the way, was named Pandora, which is another reference to Greek mythology. According to Strickland, Gabe had been worshipped by the Amazonians as a god as well, before he was captured in a river in South America. And for those of you who are going to ask, yes, I do still think it's possible that Gabe is unofficially the creature from the Black Lagoon. The information we got in the movie only furthers the notion, and when Gabe carries Eliza into the water just before the credits rolled, I immediately got a flashback to the way the creature picks up Kay and carries her in Creature from the Black Lagoon. It almost had to be a nod from Del Toro. But my point is that the Amazonians worship Gabe as divinity, and by the end of the movie, he makes a case that he really is a god by healing some injuries John Coffey style, giving Eliza the power to control water, and possibly causing it to rain so that the canal would fill up in time for the floodgates to open. He's also captivated at the movie theater watching the story of Ruth, which I haven't seen, but apparently involves the worship of gods and idols. Did anyone else catch that the movie theater was supposed supposedly scientifically air-conditioned? I'm... what does that even mean? Uh, anyway, let's see what else we've got in here. There are a couple of posters in the women's locker room to analyze. The first is a simple PSA by the city of Baltimore to save water. The other says, loose lips might sink ships. My first thought was the song XO by Fall Out Boy, but given that the movie takes place 43 years before From Under the Cork Tree came out, I decided to look it up. And apparently it was an actual piece of World War II propaganda, basically encouraging soldiers not to give away their plan to the enemy. I find the choice kind of ironic considering that Eliza has no voice due to her neck being injured as a baby. It's not entirely clear what happens at the end of the movie, but I got the sense that her neck scars ended up being a blessing in disguise because Gabe turns them into gills. It seemed like she was able to breathe underwater at the end, but let me know how you perceived it too. It was also symbolic how Gabe stabs Strickland in the throat at the end, so that as Eliza moves to a place where she doesn't need her voice, Strickland is silenced. And if there's a meaning behind Strickland's death, I think his initial injury, where he loses his fingers, is also significant. He ends up losing his ring finger and his pinky finger. The pinky represents a promise he made to his superior, General Hoyt, to protect the asset, which he breaks. The ring finger represents his marriage to his wife, with whom he is unfaithful. He tries to reattach these fingers to patch the mistakes that he has made, but because his character is not genuine, they never mesh back into his body and he just ends up ripping them out again. I just opened up the new CZ's World of Merch store and there are some killer designs that you're going to want to get your claws on, like CZ's World and Kill, the CZ's World Cafe, and the classic logo design. I'm also going to give away a free merch item to one lucky contest winner. All you have to do to enter is upload a picture of yourself with one item from the merch store and tag CZ's World. You can enter as many photos as you want with the same merch item. Full contest rules can be found in the description. And with that, I will let you grab your camera and get to work. But first, make sure you like this video and subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week. Ring that death bell for notifications and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive.